What if I were to tell you that God has 72 names, and that each of those names was also an angel? We'll tell you all about it, and list them in great detail, and tell you a little bit about each of their favorite breakfast cereals, coming up on Talk Gnosis. Hi everybody, welcome to Talk Gnosis. I'm Father Tony, joining me is my co-host Jonathan Stewart. Hello Jonathan. Hello Father Tony. So we have an interesting show tonight. We have uh, Monsignor Scott Rossback from the Apostolic Joe and I Church in Portland, and he is going to talk to us a little bit about the Shem Hameferash. Is that correct? Did I say that right? Yes, you did. Hi Tony, hi Jonathan, how are you guys? Great, Good. great. Yes, we should say voice of uh, Monsignor Rossback because we're having a little trouble with his video. So just got a, a fantastic picture of him to, uh, <laughs> to take his place. So we, we hope you like that. Anyway, so uh, why don't you take it away, Monsignor? Why don't you tell us a little bit about what the Shem Hamifarash is and where it comes from and, and uh, tell me a little bit about all their favorite breakfast cereals. All right. Well, the Shem HaMeferesh is a series of angels that are associated with the different signs of the zodiac. There are 72 of them, which are based off of three verses in Exodus, Exodus 19, 20, and 21. In Exodus in Hebrew, they have the unique property of each line having 72 letters. And each one of those letters, when stacked on top, when those verses are stacked on top of each other, one going from right to left, the next one going from left to right, and then right to left again, you end up with these 72 names of God. And they're very prevalent in Kabbalistic thought. So you can use these names to access different aspects of deity when you're doing Kabbalah or Gematria or any of those fun Kabbalistic games that they like to play. Mm -hmm. So each one has an angel associated with it. So you take those three letters and you add the ending Aleph Lamed, so Al, or you take the ending and you add uh, Yod He, so Ia. So, for instance, the first angel is Vav He Vav Yod He, Vahavia. That's the angel's name. That's what you would use to do some interesting work with it. And sometimes you get some neat names that kind of repeat. So you get a Yod Yod something, and there's one angel whose name is Yod Yod Yod. So his name is like Yah Yah El. So oh, he's fun at parties. He's definitely fun at parties. He's, you know, YOLO, you only live once. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, who came up with this? Was this uh, one of those traditional things that was passed down from mouth to ear, or is this more recent? Well, this was written in the Zohar depending on when you determine when the Zohar was written, it's either ancient or quite modern, modern-ish, medieval. Uh, it's purported to have been written by Rav Shimon Bar Yochai, who apparently was a Kabbalistic rabbi in the 13th century. Uh, so it comes out of that Kabbalistic tradition that was very prevalent in the Middle Ages, right around the Crusades and the Reconquista and that sort of era. Mm. And for those viewers who aren't as familiar with uh, Kabbalah, um, I mean, they probably are familiar with the Tree of Life and, uh, you know, some of those other uh, Kabbalistic uh, things that, that you see around um, uh, Madonna with her red strings and whatnot. Um, is that an old reference? Do people get that anymore? I, I don't know. <laughs> but well, it's uh, not all that old, but yeah, I oh, get it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, what uh, what is the the um, the Zohar, and what how does it relate to the Kabbalistic tradition? Well, the Zohar is one of the main texts of the Kabbalistic resist, uh, uh, tradition, and it is the one that lays out a lot of Jewish mystical thought. It's actually a group of books that comment on the mystical aspects of the Torah. And it literally means splendor or radiance. So it's definitely part of that Gnostic tradition that leads into the light and finding that light of God. So I think it's kind of on that continuum. I'm not saying it's Gnostic itself, but it's it's definitely in that tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, some time ago, um, Monsignor Stratford did an interesting diagram of um, the three uh, religions of the book, right? And he did a little Venn diagram with each of them. Um, 
and in the center was a circle called mysticism. And then in each of the, you know, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, there was a little little part of it that was the mysticism part. And uh, Gnosticism was Christianity, Sufism was Islam's, and Kabbalah was uh, the uh, Judaic mysticism uh, practice. And they all kind of share that, that inner circle of, you know, the... Um, in other words, that the mysticism is all the same, just kind of the trappings around it get changed depending on your kind of cultural frame of reference. And I think that's definitely true. Um, and I have to be honest with you, I am not an expert on the Zohar or Kabbalah. And the, all I know is that this is the source material for these letters. But as you work with it in a more Gnostic context, you start to pull out aspects of the temple and uh, Judaism into a more Gnostic idea. And in, in the medieval times, you start to get into like Key of Solomon and sort of rituals and summonings, which is where the angels start to come in. Hmm. You can use these angelic names in a... A key of Solomon kind of way, a ritual that where you would take and lay out your circles and do your summonings and say the names of God and then say the names of these angels and associate them with elements and with uh, uh, zodiacal angels and zodiacal elements and cardinalities and all that sort of thing and build this sort of environment during the summoning period where you would get to come in and experience the angel and what it has to tell you. So that's so, been my experience with it. So, Monsignor, these, these 72 names of God are both uh, names for for the uh, uh, divinity, the, the kind of familiar divinity that we know from the Judeo-Christian tradition, but there are, each of the 72 are also uh, a separate entity, or, or do you see them as being attributes or emanations or masks of, of the singular divine unity? Or, or are they kind of separate characters? What's, what's sort of your thought uh, or, or experience or ideas about that? My experience with it would be much more uh, following the pseudo-dynastic mystical names theory. Uh, in his book, Mystical Names, he talks about how God has all these titles. So he's mm -hmm. the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and Exalted and all of these sorts of things. That's the, the sort of title that these are. These are titles for that singular divinity. And so as that title, they are a lens for viewing divinity that gives it specific properties. It's okay. like looking through rose-colored glasses versus looking through collens collect uh, corrective lenses. One will make it clearer, one will make it colored. But it depends on which name you're using tells you the kind of interaction you're going to have. Or to put it another way, think about when your mom would talk to you. If your mom called you honey or sweetie, you knew you were okay. If she used all three of your names, she knew you were in trouble. So... <laughs> Yes. So tell us a little bit about the, um, the, 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 the kind of practical use for, and I don't know, maybe practical is the wrong word, but the, uh, how are these names used in, uh, in kind of a Western magical tradition? Well, in the tradition that I'm mostly familiar with is uh, Joseph Wolf does a lot of work with this and summoning with this, and he's written several books, and I've worked with him on those. And when he does the summonings, he is definitely doing it in a very uh, Western ceremonial tradition. So there's wands and there's altars and uh, cloths. There are the two pillars, Yaquin and Boaz, that you're using as a stand-in for the temple. And it's, it's a very unique sort of summoning in that it, it really builds an environment where you can access these angels and what the angels have to offer. Uh, if you give me just a moment, I can walk you through sort of what an angel would have to offer as I'm thinking. <laughs> so uh, let's take an, uh, an example of the angel Mahashia, who is from 20 to 25 degrees of Leo. And the letter is, uh, the name would be M He Sheen. Those are the three letters from God. And then you add the Yod He at the end to get Mahashia. Uh, this is an angel that is the most hidden of all the Leo angels, and they strategize to look for answers for people's problems. So this is an angel of Leo, so it's kind of a, a hunting image, an image of a lion hunting at night 
finding new resources that can help you with your problems, knowledge and uh, that's not obvious, hidden, able to pick out things that are useful and attainable from a great deal of noise. So that's what you would summon this angel for. If you have a, a sort of situation where you would need some kind of information that's not immediately apparent to you in your situation because your situation is very confused, you would call on this angel and they would point you to the pieces that you would need. Where do you fall on the spectrum of um are these individual entities with uh, their own ontological realities, as it were, or are they psychological processes, or are they both, or neither? Or Well, I have to tell you that when I started doing this work, I definitely saw them as psychological processes. Since I've been doing the work, that has changed. That has changed a lot. They are definitely some sort of alternate experience and being that's from outside. Now, I don't know exactly how ontological they are, um, because when we define existence, we tend to think of material existence, and I don't know that they have that. But I do think it's bigger than just a simple individual psychological process. So it could be a, a collective psychological process, or it could be some sort of underlying reality. I don't know. I haven't gotten that far but I've definitely ruled out psychological processes because there's stuff in there that definitely did not come from me mm. <laughs> when I was reading through things. When, I, when I've been interacting with these angels, some of them, it's very interesting, are very chatty and really want to talk to you, and they talk to you about things that you have no idea necessarily what they're going on about or why it's important. And then some of them simply won't talk to you at all. They just, they're like, we have nothing to discuss. And I don't know if that's due to like astrological things in my own chart or what's going on, but it's just been bizarre. <laughs> and I keep doing it because it's hilarious and bizarre and fun and sometimes scary. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I want to get into some more detail about these, um, but I don't, uh, well, I don't think we have enough time to really get into it um, in the few minutes that we have left here. So uh, here's what we'll do. Let's, uh, let's call this an episode and then let's shift over to the podcast version and then we can really get into some more detail about it um, and, and kind of dig in. So uh, uh, Jonathan, any final questions before we go to that? Anything you want to? Um, well, if we, if we have time to address it, but uh, you know, we had that great show on Enochian and John D. Uh, which was really, uh, which was really awesome. Yeah. And there's a very complicated Anakian system for summoning angels, and I just wanted to ask um, Monsignor what, what, uh, Rosbach what he thinks about all these different systems. Are uh, kind of similar to Father Tony's questions. Are, are these different systems just ways for for us to get a handle on these on these entities and these deeper concepts, or do they sort of have an ontological outside reality? So I guess yeah. I, I, I am not an expert on Enochian, and I haven't really studied it, but I've been to a couple of Enochian scryings. Mm -hmm. What I have to say is they have a very different character. I okay. think that the, the angels of the Zohar have a very set cultural and, and uh, a specific sort of flavor to them, whereas the Enochians get much more alien. Uh, I think the, the angels of the Shemham Eferish have a more relatable character to them than the ones that I've encountered in the Anakian. Uh, I think that you'll you'll end up on a weirder level with the Anakian <laughs> than you will with the the Shem HaMeferesh. They're much more accessible, they're much more human relatable. The Anakians tend to be very uh, I don't even know how to put it, complicated I guess would be a good way. Interesting. Uh, well, all right then. So let's uh, let's let's cut it there. We'll go over to the podcast. But for those of you who are watching this video right now, do you have any experience uh, with angels in your own personal work, uh, spiritual work? Please let us know in the comments. We'd love to hear your stories about that. Um, Monsignor Rasbach, let us know where people can find you on the internet. Uh, they can definitely find me on Facebook. They can find me at the Apostolic Joannite Church. And they can find the books of Joseph Wolf on Amazon. And I would definitely look for those if you're interested in this sort of thing. All right. Yeah, we'll be sure to put a link in the, uh, 
in the show notes for that in, uh, in the description down there. So ch check that out. Take a look. Anyway, uh, thank you all for watching. Please stay tuned for the podcast. It's coming up uh, very shortly. Um, depending on when you see this, it could have already come out in the past. That's how the internet works. So uh, anyway, have a good evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are, and we'll see you next week. This has been a production of the Gnostic Wisdom Network. For more information about this and all of GWN's programming, please visit GnosticWisdom.net. The opinions expressed in this show do not necessarily reflect the opinions of GWN, the Apostolic Joannite Church, or any other organization. This has been released under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 International License and is brought to you by the generous support of our patrons. To support our programs and become a patron, please visit patreon.com slash gnostic. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash g-n-o-s-t-i-c.